Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse number 121, which reads as follows. Mava manyeta papasa namandang agamisati udabindu nipatena udakambo pi purati balo purati papasa Tokang tokampi atinam. Which means one should not look down, one should not think little of evil. Thinking na mandang agamisati, it will not come. This will not come to me. So one should not <coughs> not look down upon, uh, not be, not think little of evil deeds, thinking evil results won't come of them. Uh, and so, in, in the case of of just a small evil deed, is the point, because. Uda bindu nipatena Uda kumbo pi purati Raindrops or water falling one drop at a time Even even one drop, even drops of water are able to fill a water pot, I think Are able to make a flood of water, is actually Uda kumbha, flood of water, or a water jug, depending who you ask. Purati fills, fills the water jug probably. In the same way, balo purati paparsa, the fool is full, becomes full of evil. Tokang tokam pi atinam, even though pi, it is gathered. Atinang Tokang Tokang. I always remember this Tokang Tokang. Tokang means a bit or a small amount. <clears throat> so Tokang Tokang means little by little. Little by little one becomes full of evil. So this was taught in regards to a certain bhikkhu, a monk whose name isn't given, but it was a monk who failed to keep, who did something actually quite, um, quite minor, and the act itself wasn't necessarily, well, wasn't terribly evil. Uh, you might even say that the act itself was negligible. Not something certainly to make a story about, but it's an interesting story. It's very short. So what happened was he he was not he didn't take care of his requisites. He didn't take care of the furniture and the bedding and his belongings in general. So um, sometimes he'd have to bring a chair outside, and then he'd leave it outside, or he'd have his his take his bedding outside to air it out his sheets or mattress or something, and then he'd leave them outside, and they'd get rained on, or he would um, leave things unattended or uncared for, and the mice would eat them, or the ants would eat them, or so on. And so he went through a lot of stuff, and a lot of, his, a lot of the belongings, not just of his, but of the sangha, of the monastery, were ruined as a result. So again, it's, it's just one of those things that shouldn't be done, but it's not like he's going to hell for it. So the monks admonished him. They said, "You know, look, you shouldn't do this. This is." Uh, or they asked him, "You know, shouldn't? Don't you think you should, you know, put your stuff away and take care of it?" And he would say to them, "You know, it's just a trifling. It's not a big deal. Really, it's it's not even really worth worth worrying about. We got more important things like meditation and uh, study and so on." And so he would do the same thing again and again, never learning, never changing. 
And so the monks you know, kind of got fed up with this, and they went to the Buddha, and they said, you know, look what's going on. And so the teacher sent, the Buddha sent for him, and said, is it true that you're acting in this way? Is it true that you don't put your belongings away? And when admonished, that you, you don't stop, you, you keep doing it. And so even to the Buddha, he said the same thing. He said, it's such a, it's such a small thing. I've only done, you know, it's wrong, but it's such a small wrong. Why worry about it? Uh, it's not worth worrying about. And the Buddha took this as an opportunity to teach. So he was concerned, not, not exactly with the act, although he did end up making a rule against leaving stuff out. But he was very, he seems concerned with the attitude. This attitude of, of making little of your faults, or dismissing small faults. Which is interesting because there's this idea of being easygoing and don't sweat the small stuff. And there's something to that, certainly. You shouldn't make things bigger than they actually are. But you can't leave, um, it's like you can't leave an infection unattended. As far as evil goes, um, there's no such thing as little. And there's another quote in here that I think we've skipped over. Um, comes from another one, and I was trying to remember it. It's uh, in regards to evil. Apakanti navamannitabang. It is not proper to say apakang, it's just a little. You should never look upon an evil deed as it's too little. So the deed itself I don't think is terribly an evil thing. It's negligent to you know to not look after your your belongings. But the attitude is much more important and the import of this verse is of course far beyond leaving stuff out and and so on. It's about the attitude of making light of something that is negligent, making light of anything that is uh, evil. And this goes back to what we were talking about in the, in the past couple of verses and even earlier verses. Like this, um, this monk who, who did whatever he wanted, aided and, and you know, it was sexually active and so on, and it seemed pleasant. You know, I mean, he, when he wasn't doing, when he wasn't doing what he wanted, he was miserable, and he was suffering physically. And so then, when he started doing whatever he wanted, he he actually flourished and prospered. He was healthier and and happier, and so on. So it looked good. It was like, well, that's you know, that's that's great. I think meditators, when they come here, they often fall into this kind of doubt. They think, you know, what am I doing here again? If I want to stop the suffering, we're talking about ending suffering, why don't I just go home? Then there would be no suffering. It's actually quite remarkable that we come to meditate at all, especially with all the wonderful things out there, wonderful ways of um, finding happiness, and finding pleasure anyway. But for some of us, for those of us who are perhaps more introspective and maybe more observant, we come to see that uh, it's not actually satisfaction, it's not actually happiness. And this is concerning as you watch yourself filling yourself up, not with happiness, but with, with desire, with greed, with attachment, and ultimately with evil. Evil meaning those things that cause you suffering. So you become more addicted and that addiction is pretty evil. I mean, in a sense, it brings suffering to you. And, uh, and also anger and frustration and, and boredom and, and uh, conflict. You know, just conflict when you, whenever you can't get what you want or someone stands in the way of you getting what you want. Well, if you have enough desire, you will create uh, great uh, conflict and, and uh, adversity. You know, even go to war over a greed. In the world, in this world, a lot, many wars are started just out over simple greed. And so it takes um, it takes real introspection to to get there. But that is the underlying truth: is that the evil doesn't go away. If you become, if you cultivate addiction, you become more addicted. If you cultivate anger and aversion, you become more set in those ways. It's, it's how habits are formed. It's how we become who we are. We come to meditate and we think that 
uh, or we're surprised uh, at how much we think and how much anger and aversion and how much greed and, and attachment and, and all these things that are inside. Where did they all come from, we think? This is like you have water dripping into the pot and then you look down and you say, oh, the pot's quite full and you don't know how did it get full, but actually the water was dripping down. The mind is the same. When you open it up and look, when you actually take a look, that's when you see what you're doing to yourself. For the most part, human beings are protected from the, uh, from the, the results on a, on a large scale. For the most part, we can uh, avoid the suffering that comes from not getting what we want or getting what we don't want. Uh, we're able to, because we live in kind of a, a, a paradise, many of us, not all of us, of course. But as a, in relative to other animals, for sure we live in a, many of us live in quite a paradise, always able to get food every day. I mean, just that, it's quite remarkable. You know? There's no reason why we should be able to get enough food to eat, but we do. We get more than enough food, and further than that, we get pleasure and entertainment and all of these things. And so, we aren't able to see what the result is of addiction, what the result is of aversion. When we don't like something, we have ways of removing it. You have pests in your home, use pesticide. We have many, many ways to get rid of the, the problems. You have a, a headache, take a pill. You have a backache, get a massage. You feel bored, there's lots of things to entertain you. And so little by little we fill up our pot. Not with good, but with evil. And the next verse, if you could guess, the next verse is going to be about doing good. You shouldn't, shouldn't, well we'll talk about that one next time. Uh, but what I wanted to say especially is meditation changes all that. Meditation allows you to see. Uh, and this is really how we understand karma in Buddhism. So people talk about karma as being a kind of a belief, and it's really not. Most people can't have to believe it because they aren't, aren't able to see it. But karma is something that you have to see on the momentary level. A person who practices insight meditation is able to understand karma, is able to see it. Because you are able to see moment to moment when I cling to things, it just leads to stress, it leads to suffering, it leads to busyness. It doesn't make me more content, more satisfied, more happy. When I get angry, the same thing. Anger is just painful and unpleasant. It causes suffering. On the other hand, when I cultivate mindfulness, when I cultivate clarity, in that moment, it's sending out goodness. It's, it's, it's rippling out the effects of it. You can see. You don't know where it's going. Just like evil, you know, when, you, when you become attached, it goes into the mix in your brain and it affects your brain and your body. You don't really see where it's going until later when it gets full and then it overflows and then you see the result. But when you meditate, you can see the source. You can see what you're sending out. You get to see how re your reactions are affecting your brain or affecting your body or affecting the world around you, the people around you and everything you say and you do. When you're mindful, you can see all this. It's the great thing about meditation. It's one of the first things you learn in the meditation practice. Not intellectually, but it's you see it. You see how the mind works. You see how karma works. So you, you lose doubt. You, 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 you lose this doubt about good and evil and right and wrong. You come to understand that there is a result. There, is, there are consequences to our actions. So this is uh, important for our meditation. It's an important encouragement, I think, especially uh, for those of us who are meditating to, to verify this and to say to ourselves, this is a great thing I'm doing, that I'm able to see this, that I can adjust and that I can um, change my habits so that I fill my pot up, not with addiction and aversion, but with mindfulness and wisdom. So that's the Dhammapada, short story, wonderful verse. Thank you all for tuning in, wishing you all the best.